Welcome to Module 6, where we are going to start our discussion of the largest scales that we'll cover in this semester, thinking about the galaxy that we live in, other types of galaxies, and the structures beyond that size. In this first video, we're going to cover one section out of Chapter 19 that we had skipped over previously, because this is the place where we really need to incorporate it into our curriculum. So let's start with a reminder that back in Module 4, we briefly touched on one method used to get the distances to nearby stars. This was called parallax, where we talked about how this same phenomenon is something you can see if you hold up your thumb to cover something while closing one eye and then switching which eye is open and your thumb appears to move back and forth against the background. Parallax is very useful for getting the distances to nearby stars, but because it needs more distant objects that you're comparing motion to, it will not work for stars on the other side of our galaxy or anything outside of our galaxy. Now, Henrietta Swan Leavitt was part of the Harvard Computers, the group of women who did data analysis to make huge steps forward in our understanding of astronomy. And her goal was to focus on stars that varied in how bright they appeared to be from Earth. Now, some of those systems that she looked at were from eclipsing binary systems. We talked about those briefly when we talked about binary stars. But there are other stars that she studied that actually pulsate. And so the reason that they look brighter and dimmer is because they actually get bigger and smaller over time. Leavitt found a clear relationship between the peak amount of brightness that we could see and the period of variability. And because she was studying these variable stars within a particular area of the sky called the Magellanic Clouds, the Large Magellanic Cloud and Small Magellanic Cloud are dwarf galaxies outside of our own Milky Way galaxy. And all of the stars in her study were the same distance away from us. So she was able to make an actual comparison between the brightness that we um, are able to measure from Earth and the true brightness of those objects. Now, Delta Cephei was the first of this type of star that she found, and so the whole category of stars is called Cepheid variables. They are not the only type of variable star, and there's a whole lot of details that we could get into if this were a course more focused on stars in general. But because this is a survey course of everything in astronomy, we're just going to focus on Cepheid variables as being an example of what we're looking at, and we're not even going to get into the specific details of them. The one point I'll note, though, is these stars are not stable. They are getting bigger and smaller, and so these are all stars that have already left the main sequence. We can see that in this um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram on the slide. All of the variable stars that are studied in astronomy in this way are unstable stars. They don't have hydrostatic equilibrium keeping them nice and steady, and that's why they pulsate. Now, work by Einar Hertzsprung, the H in the HR diagram, and by Harlow Shapley helped to calibrate the distances so that rather than just having a brightness period relationship, we actually had a luminosity relationship. And so this is called the period luminosity relationship for Cepheid variables. And I want to go through um, how that works. So first of all, the way that they were able to calibrate it was by finding Cepheid variables that also had parallax measurements or proper motion measurements so that we had a different way to know how far away they were. And then that basically allows us to build this relation. And what that looks like is on the far right of our screen, all of these different points that have luminosity on the vertical axis and period on the horizontal axis, all of those points form a line. And then we can study a new star and use this relationship. So for example, if we look at this um, curve here. Magnitude, as a reminder, we've mentioned it briefly, is a way for astronomers to describe brightness. This is a Cepheid variable that gets dim, and then it gets bright, and then it gets dim, and then it gets bright. And if we look at when the brightness happens, so this was at day three of this person's study, 
and at day nine it got bright again, that means that that is a six day period for this star. If we go over to this chart then, to roughly around six days, we go up to where all the points are on the graph, and we look, okay, what that means is the star that we're looking at, that we have an apparent brightness for, is also going to give us a luminosity, a true brightness, and with those two numbers, we can get the distance. On the slide here, um, she's writing out the distance modulus. That's not an equation that we've um, introduced in this set of lecture videos. But the idea is still something we've mentioned briefly, that if you have the apparent brightness and the true brightness, the way um, that those differ from each other is just distance. And so even if we're not doing that calculation, we hopefully have enough from our previous understanding to know that that's possible. Okay, so why do Cepheid variables matter? They matter because they allow us to map even larger distances than parallax would allow. One of the first attempts to make a map of our place in the larger structure of our sky were the siblings Sir William Herschel and Caroline Herschel who attempted to map out stars by counting how many they saw in every direction that they looked. The major problem that they had to deal with is that dust blocks our view of more distant stars. So when they made their map, what we get is kind of like a fog of war in video games. We haven't really explored that map, but that doesn't mean that there aren't stars further out there. It's just that we can't see them. There is interstellar dust that is blocking that light. So this initial map makes it look like we are the center of this structure that we might call the galaxy, but it's very limited and biased towards what we're able to see from our location. If you're in the middle of a very dense forest, you can count how many trees you see in each direction, and they might seem like there's roughly the same in every direction, but that doesn't mean that you're at the center of the forest, just that your, your view is being blocked um, of more distant objects. So Cepheid variables became the key in allowing us to make a more accurate map. Harlow Shapley, one of the two people who calibrated the period luminosity relation for Cepheid variables, found them in globular clusters. We talked about star clusters in module five, they're um, in chapter 22 of OpenStax Astronomy, and he was able to find at least one Cepheid variable in a large number of these globular clusters, hundreds of thousands of stars that now we know the distance to. When he made a map of those, instead of being at the center of this map of objects, we were much closer to the edge of that map. And there was stuff that was clearly above and below where most of the stars seemed to be from the Herschel map. So this begs the question then, which of these maps is accurate? What is the structure of our galaxy? One of the biggest problems that we have is that we are stuck inside our Milky Way galaxy. The view on the screen right now is our view of the galaxy over the entire um, sky seen from Earth. We can see in the middle of this picture that there's clearly more stuff in one direction than on the edges. And this is a map uh, that kind of encircles the entire view from Earth, 360 degrees. And we can tell that there's stuff in a narrow band, and not as much above and below, but it is, in fact, quite difficult to map out the structure of the galaxy that we're stuck inside of. But we have been able to do it through a lot of different methods, not just the Herschel counting or even Harlow Shapley's globular clusters, but finding lots of different um, tracers of where material is and by looking at other galaxies and their structure to get a sense of what the range of possibilities could be for ours. So this is roughly where our understanding is. When we think about the top-down view that we might have of our galaxy, it is a spiral galaxy. If you've ever doodled a little tiny galaxy in your um, the margins of your notes, whether that was in elementary school or right now as you're taking notes, um, we tend to draw spiral galaxies. We'll be talking in the next couple of videos that that's not the only type of galaxy out there. 
But when we think about the previous picture, let me go back to it briefly, we also know that most of the stuff lies in a very narrow band, a disk, as it were. So when we look on the right side of the screen, when we look at the um, edge-on view of our galaxy, we realize that it is, in, quack, in fact, quite thin. Um, and so our view is from where the sun's location is. It's 26,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. We don't need to memorize that number, but about two thirds out is a useful, um, a useful thing to have in mind. We're closer to the edge of the galaxy than we are to the center of it. And it has a central bar. We will talk about barred spirals compared to uh, grand design spirals later on in our module. When we think about the main components of our galaxy, they really come down to two very basic categories and a couple of finer details. The disk is one of the most important aspects of a spiral galaxy. Most of the stars and dust in our galaxy are in a narrow, thin disk that all rotates in the same way. It contains most of the stars and nearly all of the dust and gas available to make new stars. It is 80,000 light years from one edge of the disk to the other edge. We don't have to memorize that number either, but it's worth having a sense of the difference between galaxy scales, tens of thousands of light years, and the distances between stars. The closest star to us is four light years away. The other major component is the halo, which is a much larger sphere of volume rather than a kind of flat area of material. And it's mostly empty of visible material, but that is where we see the globular clusters. And that's why Herschel's um, map didn't have these, because we're just counting individual stars. But Harlow Shapley's map did include things in the halo where he was seeing that there's a lot of stuff above and below if we're looking at these star clusters, these globular clusters. At the center of our galaxy, there is also a large bulge where stars don't have this nice flat rotation, but are kind of all over the place. And at the very center, there's what's called the nucleus of our galaxy, and we'll be talking about that in a couple of videos in more detail. Now, the one thing I need us to really be aware of is that it is difficult to make an accurate map of the Milky Way galaxy. We are stuck inside it. Distances are hard in general, and because dust gets in our way, we have to rely on a, several different types of evidence to build a overall understanding of the structure. And if anyone ever shows you a picture of a full spiral galaxy and says that it's our Milky Way galaxy, they've been led astray. We often use real pictures of other similar galaxies to say, hey, this is what ours probably looks like, or we make a um, artist conception. So this picture here is our best current understanding of what the Milky Way galaxy structure looks like. And as a reminder, this is not a picture. We cannot leave our galaxy to go back and take a picture of it. We can't even get to the closest star to us. And so we need to build that awareness of not number value distances, those numbers aren't that useful to have in mind, but the understanding that from one star to the next closest star is well outside of our technology capabilities. And even the up and down um, width of the disk of material is hundreds of light years, and so we cannot leave our galaxy. Okay, just a couple more slides for this video um, so that we can move on to other aspects of our galaxy. The Sun is located on what's called the Orion Spur. It's named because most of the stars that we think of as being in the constellation of Orion and Orion's nebula and all of that material, that is actually physically close to us. It's why the Orion stars look so bright in our sky. They're quite close. And why the Orion Nebula is one that shows up over and over in our slides because it's big and bright and visible um, because it is so close to us. All of the other spiral arms and um, whether they're major or minor, they are all named for the constellation that we looked in to find the first clear 
evidence for it. If we look at this picture, the Perseus arm goes all the way through where we find ourselves. Um, and the constellation Perseus is only in one direction, but it's just named after where we first found it. That's why all of these tend to have constellation names. It's just what direction were we looking when we discovered it. The one last thing that I need us to be aware of is that the arms, the spiral arms of the galaxy that we are so familiar with, the most, the simplest explanation that we could kind of come up for ourselves for what they are is just that they are being wound tighter and tighter by the rotation of the galaxy. If we think about um, the Kepler's laws that we talked about way back in module one for planets in our solar system, the closer the planet was to the sun, the faster it goes, and the farther away, the slower. We identify that that's because of Isaac Newton's understanding of gravity. Um, and at the galaxy scale, the same general idea does happen. Stars that are closer to the center of the galaxy, they do orbit around the galaxy faster than stars that are further out. For example, the sun takes 220 million years to make one big orbit. If we were closer, we would do that orbit much quicker. However, just having like big dust clouds that are being wound up tighter and tighter does not fit observations of galaxies. If this were the case, then the older a galaxy is, the more tightly wound the arms would be. And that's just not what we see when we look around at um, galaxies in our field of view. Instead, the arms are a spiral density wave. Now, what that means is the spiral arms are a pattern that moves through the galaxy independent of the motion of the star's orbits. The very best analogy that I can give for us, and when we're in a classroom, I actually make students do the wave. The very best analogy I can um, give for us is if you've ever been in a sports stadium where somebody starts the wave, and you can see people standing in their seats and um, raising their arms. And that pattern moves around the entire stadium. You can see the pattern. All of those people aren't leaving their seats and running through the stadium. They just have their arms up and then they don't anymore. The spiral arms of a galaxy are very similar to that process where the people who are currently standing up in their seats with their arms raised and cheering those are where the spiral arms actively are and are actively making stars. And then the pattern moves on, people sit down in their seats and now they have new stars in that area. So I'll leave us with that. If you have questions, please post them in the, in the discussion board, but we'll be adding to our understanding of what our galaxy is and other things that we've been able to study from it in upcoming videos. So I will see you then.